Okay, so what I will tell you about today is um, some of our research on slow and stop light um, and how we can use extremely cold atoms, both Einstein condensates, to slow light down to the speed of a bicycle, as you sort of see here, uh, and how we can also completely uh, stop light pulses. And then I'll simply use that um, as a backdrop to uh, tell you about some of our more recent research, and including um, some experiments where, where we show that we can stop and extinguish a light pulse in one part of space and then regenerate it, revive it in a completely different location and send it back on its way. And at the very end I'll uh, tell you some of our very latest stuff. But as I already indicated, we need some really, really cold atoms for these experiments. And, and when I say cold, I mean uh, nano-Kelvin temperatures. That's a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And we need that to, to create these Bose-Einstein condensates that we use as a basis for these experiments. And as you can guess, you, you're not going to get to these temperatures with your kind of standard household kitchen refrigerator. We need a very special atom refrigerator. And, and what I show here is a sketch of, of what our uh, refrigerator looks like, what it looks like, what we have in the lab right now. And to give you a sense of the scale, it's roughly two by three meters in size. And uh, currently for these experiments, we use sodium atoms. So of course we need a, a source of everything. We start out with an atom source where we take a clump of, of sodium metal stick it in there, and of course everything is in the vacuum, um, and create a localized hotspot that we heat to about 350 degrees centigrade, so we get a good vapor pressure of these sodium atoms, so we can get a good emission rate out of this source. We collimate the beam, and fantastic, we get a good intense collimated beam of sodium atoms coming, coming right out of the source. That's wonderful. The only problem is that these atoms, because of the high temperature, come out with very high velocities, roughly 600 meters a second. And that's really much too high that we can effectively use these atoms. So what we do is, as soon as the atoms come out of, of the source, we hit them head on with a laser beam. Uh, we send a yellow laser beam up through the system. And as I say, we, we hit the atoms head on and then use radiation pressure from that laser beam to slow the atoms down. Now by tuning that uh, laser to the precise, the, the exact right frequency, the exact right color, uh, yellow in this case, um, such that it matches the resonance frequency, uh, the characteristic frequency of the sodium atoms, we can get a very dramatic interaction between atoms and laser light. And again, to give you the scale, this laser pointer here, my guess is, is probably roughly five milliwatts of power. And the laser beam we are using for slowing the atom is actually not all that much different. It's roughly 50 milliwatts uh, of power that we, we focus to roughly 100 microns, uh, 100 microns spot at, at the source. And with that laser beam, we can now get a deceleration of the atoms that's uh, 100,000 times larger than the deceleration in the gravitational field. So in a matter of just uh, a meter length here, uh, one millisecond in time, we can slow the atoms from the roughly 600 meters a second to 50 meters a second at the end of the slower. And now we can load the atoms very efficiently into an optical molasses created in the middle of our ultra-high vacuum chamber uh, and it's created by three pairs of counter-propagating laser beams. There's a beam pair going in and out of the board. And these lasers are now tuned just slightly below in frequency, slightly below that uh, characteristic uh, sodium resonance frequency. And then for the main part of that laser cooling process, we, um, we use the Doppler effect to create a very viscous medium for the atoms. And we can now um, load that optical molasses uh, with about a billion atoms in a, a second or two, and then cool them to 50 microkelvin. And uh, this is a sketch of it. So let me just show you what it looks like actually in the lab when we are laser cooling. We have a 5 by 16 uh, foot optics table. The, the light might actually be a little bit bright for the, for the slide, but um, we have a 5 by 16 foot uh, optics table um, and there's a filled, if you can see, uh, with a whole bunch of, uh, really to the brim with, with opt uh, optics and optical gizmos. And we have a dye laser system over in one corner and then another dye laser system in the bottom corner, uh, just uh, outside the image. And you could say pretty much the, 
the optics is here to split these two laser beams into a whole bunch of different laser beams, different in uh, frequencies, uh, intensity modulated, uh, so, so we can partly do our laser cooling job and partly can create some uh, light pulses, laser pulses that we then want to slow down eventually. So let me show you the same in, in uh, daylight. And I think you can get a sense of that there's, uh, uh, again, it's a little bit on the dark side, but I think you can get a sense of, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of absolutely filled with, with optics everywhere. And there's quite a few of, of men and women hours that have gone into to building that setup. And when we run, uh, it's ab absolutely all in swing. There's not a single piece that's just sitting there for, for storage. And if we by mistake sort of put a, a, a mount down, uh, you know, we don't think about it, for sure it's not working, we're blocking some laser beam. Um, and if you look over on the side here, you see this Ragon looking structure, that's this atom slower I mentioned to you. And if we get closer to that one, we can see the uh, vacuum chamber at the end of the slower uh, sitting off to the side of the optics table. And that's, uh, it's really that vacuum chamber where the main action takes place. And we have vacuum uh, flanged windows everywhere on, on this vacuum chamber, and you can see one of them close up here. So when we laser cool, detection is really easy. We can simply just look through one of these windows and we can see the cold atoms by eye. Because during the laser cooling process, these uh, ad uh, atoms keep absorbing laser photons, and then they re radiate spontaneously, they fluoresce and they fluoresce yellow. So uh, it's, it's lo it looks like a little bright sun. Uh, freely suspended in the middle of the vacuum chamber by the laser beam, so it's a cloud, atom cloud, that's 5 to 10 millimeter in diameter. Now, what this, this shows that this system is really accessible. We can have these like really cold atoms in the middle of the vacuum chamber, but the vacuum chamber itself is just sitting at room temperature. So now rather than just looking at the atoms, we can start to send laser beams in uh, through the windows, hit the atoms, manipulate them, make them do exactly what we want, and that's precisely what we do when we create slow light. But as you have noticed, we're not quite there yet because with laser cooling, we very quickly get down to micro Kelvin. But for the last of the cooling process, for <coughs> nano Kelvin, it really pays to uh, turn the lasers off and then turn on an electromagnet. Uh, use the fact that the atoms are small magnets, they have a magnetic dipole moment, so we can trap them in a spatially varying magnetic field. And our electromagnet, there are four D-shaped magnet pieces uh, separated by about an inch, just uh, enough to get the laser beams in and out of the system during the laser cooling process. And when we fire this magnet up, we fire it up with about 1,000 amperes of current that we turn on in a millisecond. So that's, of course, also a great engineering problem to, uh, to create a, a, a switch that can, uh, uh, you know, we turn it on in a millisecond, switch it off in 200 microseconds. Um, so there, there's a lot of fun going into that as well. And uh, once it's fired up, we uh, trap a cloud, uh, uh, happily trap sodium atoms, and then we actually start to boil the hottest of, of the atoms in, in the trap cloud uh, off. We, we selectively kick off the hottest, the most energetic atoms in the sample. And the way we do that, that is we apply a transverse radio frequency field um, so we can selectively uh, spin flip those guys and, and kick them out of the magnet. And by simply uh, controlling the frequency and, and the frequency sweep of that RF field, we can control exactly how cold this cloud gets. And if we uh, cool far enough down, we will start to create those Einstein condensates. And I sort of have a little sketch here where what you see is, is a, a roughly parabolic uh, shape of the trapping potential from the magnet uh, that holds the uh, atoms in place and as we cool, we, as I say, we boil off the most energetic guys and eventually the atoms will all start to pile into the quantum mechanical ground state uh, in that magnet. And that's really the idea behind Bose-Einstein condensation, that you get a macroscopic population of atoms all described by the same quantum mechanical wave function. So in a real sense, the, the atoms uh, get phase-locked. Um, and then we uh, create this uh, cloud of atoms. It's, it's actually when it, we uh, create the condensated, the, the atom cloud actually turns superfluid. And um, well, I think you have perhaps a little bit of a sense of that uh, things in this experiment have to be tuned up exactly right uh, to work. And we tend to run for many hours when we run uh, sensitive experiments. And of course, uh, everybody can get uh, tired every now and then. Thank <laughs> you.
this is uh, Sean Garner. He is uh, uh, he was our postdoc who had just started at that time in the group, and he wasn't quite up to speed yet. <laughs> But if you actually manage to stay awake, this is uh, kind of the most exciting part of the whole experiment because now we have uh, trapped in the magnet a pretty much pure Bose-Einstein condensate with some five, 10 million atoms in it. And the condensates uh, are typically 100 micron in size, 0.1 millimeter. And cigar shape, that's a typical shape of them. Uh, but after we form them, we can adiabatically reshape them pretty much into whatever shape we would like. And in this situation, we now start hitting them uh, with laser beams, and um, we'll start to create some slow light. And how do we create slow light more precisely? Well, so far, I have really been focused on uh, the motion, the translational motion of the whole atom uh, as it's moving around in the magnet, and how we damp out that motion when we laser cool. What I'll do now is I'll, I'll start to focus on the internal structure of an atom. So what I show here are uh, a bunch of the possible quantum mechanical allowed, quantum mechanical internal energy levels in the atom. More precisely, it's, it's the uh, hyperfine structure of the yellow D2 line in sodium. And when we're done with the uh, cooling process, all the atoms are trapped also in a particular internal quantum state. It's actually the ground state that I, uh, in my talk, will call the one state for good reasons. Um, and with all the atoms in that uh, ground state, that one state, we will start out by illuminating the cloud with a laser beam. We call it the coupling laser. It's actually a yellow laser beam, but it's indicated in this drawing here by the red transition. So it's two non-resonance between two levels, uh, level two down here and a level three up here. And clearly, uh, this laser beam here is not going to affect atoms in this completely different quantum state down here. Uh, for example, the frequency is completely wrong. Uh, but it actually, as we will see in a moment, it will actually manipulate the optical properties of the atom cloud such that when we now send a uh, laser pulse in, we call it the probe laser pulse, it's uh, on resonance with a transition indicated by blue. It will now uh, be able to, to slow that laser pulse down dramatically. So let me show you that in a more simplified uh, diagram where I only show the three atomic levels coupled by the two laser fields, um, the probe and the coupling laser field. And if we forget for a moment about the probe laser field and just consider the three level atom in the presence of the coupling laser field. And then just for a microsecond assume that uh, we have no coupling between states uh, two and three. Well in that situation we would say if we look at that total system of atom and coupling laser light, if we have the atom in state two in the presence of one coupling laser photon, that state of the system will have exactly the same energy as if I have the atom in state three and no photons present. But now, of course, there is a coupling between states two and three. It's an electric dipole coupling induced by the coupling laser itself. That coupling will now split the degeneracy and we will, instead of having one energy level up here, we'll end up with two nearby split energy levels. And the stronger the coupling laser, the more intense it is, the bigger is the splitting. The splitting is actually proportional to the square root of the intensity of the coupling laser. Uh, in a, another way of saying it is that the splitting is determined by the Rabi frequency of the coupling laser. Now in this situation, let's uh, let the probe uh, pulse in. Now that probe laser beam will see a very strange <coughs> refractive index. And I show it down here, refractive index, as a function of, of its frequency, as a function of its detuning from the 1, 3 resonance frequency. This looks pretty weird, but we can kind of understand it from what I just did, described, because it's sort of a superposition of two refractive index wiggles. There's a wiggle centered on a, a frequency right here, corresponding to the transition from the ground <coughs> to the lower of the two split states. And then there's another wiggle right here, centered on a frequency uh, corresponding to the transition from the ground to the upper, upper of the two split states. Now, if I tune the probe laser pulse right on resonance, meaning smack in between the two uh, levels here, that's obviously a point of high symmetry. In this situation, it's, it's as if I am driving two harmonic oscillators, one oscillator a little bit above resonance and the other one the same amount below resonance. That means these two oscillators will be driven 108 degrees out of phase. So the net effect is there's no excitation in the system, no uh, dipole moment induced, the refractive index is one, 
exactly what it is in free space. So we force um, the refractive index to go to one in the middle, and that actually forces a very steep slope of that refractive index profile around resonance, and that's what we're using to slow light, uh, because the signal velocity or group velocity of a light pulse is inversely proportional to that uh, slope of the refractive index profile. And now with very cold atoms, we have no Doppler shifts, all the energy levels are very sharply defined, so we can now use very weak coupling laser intensities, bring these levels very close together, and sort of squish this structure here from the two sides and create a really, really uh, steep refractive index uh, slope. And that's what we use when we want to uh, dramatically slow light down. But I, before we get to the experiments, I should mention something also about the transmission of these uh, light pulses through the atom cloud, because of course, uh, we should realize we are dealing with cold atoms uh, and very dense atom clouds. So that means if in the absence of the coupling laser, if we try to send the probe laser pulse into the system, we would get absolutely no light through the system. We would get a transmission of roughly e to the minus 1,000. That's not a lot of light. Um, and luckily, by first turning the coupling laser on and then sending the light pulse in, we can create a narrow transmission window around resonance. So it's like getting light through a wall. The fact that we get uh, this transmission window and the fact that we actually can maintain very steep slopes of that refractive index profile, even when we have damping in the system, for example, spontaneous emission damping from the upper state three, they're both due to that we create a quantum interference, a destructive quantum interference in the system. So we are playing with quantum mechanics here and uh, how that works, how that comes about, it's most easily seen for the transmission case, so let me explain that one. Because we can say, what is transmission, or equivalently, what is absorption? Well, if the atom absorbs a probe laser photon, it'll get excited from state one to state three. But now the system obviously has another path to reach that final state three, because it could also start out in state two and absorb a coupling laser photon. And now quantum mechanics tells us that if there are two paths to the same final state, and we want to figure out what is the probability for reaching that final state, we should actually sum the uh, probability amplitudes for these two paths, they are complex numbers, before uh, sum them before we take the absolute value and square it to get the probability. But now, of course, the thing with complex numbers is that, in particular, they can be negative. So we can, if we play our cards right, we can get these two uh, path to exactly cancel, so create a, a destructive interference. And what does it mean to um, play our cards right? It means that we should bring the atom into a superposition state of states one and two, and a very particular one. So uh, a superposition state of state one and two, so the atom is both in one and two at the same time, and with the exact right amount in each, such that the population amplitude for the atom in two relative to one so ratio I have down here, is proportional to the ratio between the electric field amplitude of the probe laser field relative to the coupling laser field. And then, of course, on that ratio is also a minus creating the destructive interference. So in that uh, very uh, uh, magic superposition state, we call it the dark state, the, the two paths cancel and there's no absorption from either laser field. And this idea of dark states is really important for everything I'm going to talk about. But at this point, uh, enough about theory, so let's, let's talk about the, uh, the experiments that we, a typical setup that we use for, for slow light. Um, so in this case, we, uh, we have the, the condensate in the middle of the vacuum chamber, and then we illuminate it from the side with a linearly uh, polarized uh, coupling laser beam and then we send the probe light pulse, the laser pulse we want to slow, we send that in along the long dimension of the atom cloud, circularly polarized. <coughs> and then we simply sit and wait uh, on the other uh, side of the chamber for this light pulse to come out, and we measure the arrival time with a photomultiplier. And of course, to figure out what the light speed is, we also need to know um, how, how uh, long the cloud is, how large the cloud is, and to figure that out, after the light pulse has propagated through the atom cloud, we send a third uh, resonant 
laser beam up through the atom cloud from down below, and now these atoms will create an absorption shadow in the laser beam, and now we can simply image that absorption shadow onto a CCD camera, take a snapshot of the cloud, and I show an example up here, a cigar-shaped cloud, clearly uh, that has been cooled to 450 nanokelvin, and in this case it's roughly 200 microns long. And now I'll show the result of uh, sending a light pulse into exactly this uh, atom cloud. So here is photomultiplier signal as a function of time in microseconds. You see the blue pulse here, that's a reference pulse recorded with no atoms in the system, just to set the zero point for the, for the time axis. And then immediately after we let atoms into the system, cool them down, and then we launch another light pulse, and in this case, we get the red uh, light pulse out, and you can see it's, it's, in this case it's delayed by seven microseconds, and that's in a cloud that's only 200 micron long. All you have to do is divide these two numbers out, you immediately get a light speed, in this case, of 32 meters a second. So you immediately slowed light by a factor of 10 million. And now by just uh, controlling the uh, intensity of, of this illuminating uh, coupling laser, you can control the splitting between the split levels, the refractive index slope, and thereby the optical de delays and the light speed. And, and, and the light speed is actually directly proportional to the intensity in that uh, coupling laser beam. And by lowering the intensity in the beam further down, we can now get down to light speeds uh, 20 kilometers an hour or even lower. And for cer certainly in, in that uh, situation, you, you can beat uh, light on your bicycle, as, as I advertised in the beginning. So at this point, I think it would be really good to, to just show you an animation of what it looks like when, when a light pulse uh, propagates through a, a cold atom cloud, because it's sort of like a visual can, can save a lot of words. Um, so here we have the, uh, the condensate that we will illuminate from the side with a coupling laser, and then we uh, send a, a probe pulse into the system, and then at the same time we have a reference pulse running here in vacuum. And then we'll compare the two, so if I kick it off. Now you can start to see what happens, because as the light pulse enters the atom cloud, the front edge will slow down, but of course, the, the back edge of the light pulse is hanging out behind, out in free space, so that'll be uh, still uh, running at, at the normal light speed. So the back edge will start to, to catch up to the front edge, and we'll start to get the pulse spatially compressed. And as we keep going, as the light slows down further, the pulse compresses further, and it actually slows down and compresses by exactly the same factor, which in this animation is by a factor of two and a half and eventually the light pulse starts to exit. The front edge takes off, accelerates back up to the normal light speed, the light pulse stretches out, energy flows back in, and ends up with exactly the shape it had before it entered the cloud. It's just tremendously delayed. So let me just uh, quickly show you one for slightly more realistic uh, parameters. This is a light slowdown of a factor of 10. So this one will look like this. So slow down compression and it kind of chucks along and then exits and stretches back out. So let me just stop it right here. Um, you might now, uh, I mean, of course, uh, realize that we are, we are not, in the, the experiments, we are not slowing light, light by a factor of two and a half or 10, we are talking uh, factors of 10 to 100 million. So that means also that the light pulse, I mean, the typical light pulses we use, they start out being a kilometer long before it enters the atom cloud. And then they compress to only uh, 20 microns, which is less than half the thickness of a hair. So even though our cold atom clouds are small, the light pulse ends up being even smaller. So it uh, snugly fits within the, uh, the condensate as shown here. Also, the light pulse uh, creates an imprint um, in the atom cloud, uh, really like a little holographic imprint. And the reason is, it's exactly because of this dark state formation. Uh, because, for example, uh, in the middle of the light pulse, the electric field amplitude is high, so a lot of the atoms in this dark state are transferred from their initial one state to the two state, if you remember that ratio. Um, but on the fringes of, of the light pulse, only a little bit of the atoms are transferred to two, 
and outside the light pulse, the, all the atoms are in the original one state. And now this, uh, so the, the, uh, the, the spatial modulation of the dark state really mimics the shape of the light pulse. And this little imprint follows along as the uh, light pulse slowly moves through the atom cloud. You might ask, uh, could we possibly stop light in the lab just as easily as I did here in the computer? Indeed, uh, all we have to do is just, once the light pulse is compressed, contained within the atom cloud, we just abrupt, abruptly block the coupling laser. And the light stops, and that's what I show on, on, uh, on these figures here. So the first uh, figure up here, that shows a uh, delay, pulse delay measurement of the type I've shown you before. We have a reference pulse and then the delayed light pulse that has been delayed by, in this case, uh, 15 microseconds. And what I also show here is the dash curve. That's the intensity of the coupling laser. And you can see how we turn on the uh, coupling laser just a little bit before, roughly a microsecond in this case, before we send the, uh, the probe pulse into the system. Now down here we do something different, because at the point in time where the light pulse has been slowed, is compressed, contained within the atom cloud, we abruptly turn off the coupling laser. And as you can see, there's no light pulse coming out, it's missing. And then we leave the coupling laser off for a while, uh, 40, 50 microseconds, and then when we feel like it, we turn it back on, and out comes the light pulse. Exactly the same shape, intensity, everything as the one we had before. So clearly in this case, we have stopped the light pulse in our atom cloud. Down here we do the same thing, but note the break in the time axis. In this case, we uh, stop the light pulse for close to a millisecond. During that time, light will propagate through free space by roughly 200 miles of free space. Um, what's happening here is that when we uh, turn the coupling laser off, the light pulse comes to a grinding halt and it actually turns itself off. But the information that was in the light pulse is not lost because that was already imprinted in the atoms through that holographic dark state imprint. And that imprint simply stays frozen in the atoms. Uh, and then later, when we uh, unblock the coupling laser, the system has all the information it needs to regenerate this light pulse, and it just moves on as if nothing had happened. Now, it's, it's of course uh, fun to, to kind of play with this system, and, and I'll just give you one example. Rather than just turning the coupling laser off and back on, we can turn the coupling laser on and off a couple of times. So uh, in the top case here, we send a single light pulse into the system, stop it, store it, and then we regenerate it in two small pieces and down here even in three small pieces. So you, start, you can start to see the kind of control we have with this system and it's, uh, it's uh, the kind of thing you, you would, could definitely think of, of using for uh, uh, dynamically controlled optical memory buffers, for example. For both, uh, it works equally well for both uh, classical light pulses and quantum uh, light pulses and there's certainly been uh, there's a huge activity uh, now of groups trying to implement uh, these kinds of effects in uh, cold atoms, uh, hot atoms, uh, solids, cold solids, hot, uh, room temperature solids, and all of that. It's very exciting. And there's certainly also a lot of very nice uh, work going on here at, at, at DTU, for example, in, in Jesper Merck's uh, uh, group um, in the photonics department. Okay, but uh, for now, I want to sort of uh, give you a sense of, of some of the more uh, recent stuff we have done and maybe just uh, start out uh, briefly mentioning um, one example where we're using uh, slow light to probe the properties, the superfluid properties of this Bose-Einstein condensate. It's kind of fun. Uh, if you might have noticed uh, the stop light experiments I just showed you, they were actually done in the co-propagating scheme where the probe and coupling beams propagate in the same direction. Now I'll return to the original orthogonal scheme where they come in at right angles to each other. Because in this scheme we can uh, do some fun stuff. For example, we can modulate the intensity of the coupling uh, laser spatially. So for example, we could block half of the coupling laser and just illuminate the front part of the condensate. And now we send the probe pulse in, and it'll slow down as usual and kind of chug along. And eventually it'll start to run into the middle of the condensate where the coupling intensity goes to zero. At that point, the light pulse should really slow down and really compress, and it can never really get past that region. So it, it really acts as a roadblock for the light pulses. <coughs> 
And um, I have a little uh, figure here showing that if you look at the uh, red curves here, they show exactly how this light pulse uh, gets really localized to rough, we could get it down to roughly a micron uh, in size, and it happens inside a condensate of initially of state one atoms that starts out with a, a parabolic density profile. But now what we're interested in here is not just what happens to the light, but actually what happens to the atoms in that condensate. And uh, there's an animation over here that will show that. So now we send that light pulse in, that you see on, on the red guy on the, on the left. And from starting with a parabolic density profile, we now start to build up the solid curve here. That is a very localized density of state one atoms. So inside the, the initial condensate of state one atoms, we create this really localized uh, defect of state two atoms. Reason is, um, inside the localized light pulse region, the atoms have to be in the dark state. And in this case, uh, light pulse is even more localized to roughly a micron, and the coupling intensity goes all the way to zero, so the atoms are fully transferred from state one to state two. Well, of course, these atoms uh, that form the state two defect, they come from somewhere, <coughs> they are taken right out of the condensate of state one atoms, so the state one condensate should then develop a very narrow density dip, as you see here. And as it turns out, we have a way of kicking, selectively kicking out that little defect of state two atoms that we have formed. And I'll get back to how that happens. But that means we should be left with, in the magnetic trap, with a condensate of state one atoms with a hole punched in the middle. So let's go to the lab and, and see what, what happens. Take an, an image after we do this process, and sure enough, uh, here's a condensate with a hole punched in the belly. And I should point out that the defects that we can create with this method are so narrow that we cannot uh, resolve them with our uh, imaging system. So to see it, we actually have to first create the defect, and then we abruptly turn off the magnet, let the cloud drop in gravity for a millisecond so that the features can uh, expand, and then we can photograph it. And what we're interested in now is, here we have a condensate. We have punched a very narrow hole. This is uh, clearly a situation totally out of equilibrium. How does a condensate react to that? Well, as we had hoped, it actually reacts quite violently. And it reacts by creating uh, the superfluid or the condensate version of shock waves. And these uh, shock fronts uh, propagate and actually break down into what's called quantized vortices. They're really the, uh, the condensate version of tornadoes with quantized circulation. And these uh, uh, tornadoes, these quantum tornadoes, are seen in our images as white dots, like localized low density regions, very much like the low density eye of a hurricane. And uh, without going into too much detail here, I'll just give you a sense of that very rich dynamics uh, in this system uh, that we can generate. So we start with a condensate with, with that narrow uh, density defect created with uh, a, a very slow compressed light pulse. And then we'll see the dynamics uh, as a function of time after that. So here it goes. So we create the shock fronts and then a bunch of vortices are formed. Some of them annihilate and we're left now with four four white dots, and they're on a collision course, and then bang, just like billiard balls. And now they scatter off the condensate boundaries, and now back in on a collision course, and now this time, poof, it just exploded in this big outgoing sound wave. So what, uh, what happens is that when we create these vortices, we create them in pairs of opposite circulation, very much like particle-antiparticle pairs. And in the last collision, Two of these uh, vortices of opposite circulation uh, got together too closely, and they actually annihilated, and the energy was carried away in this outgoing sound wave. We have seen a lot of this uh, really interesting dynamics in, in the lab, and it's also led to some real surprises where we, for a while, had no idea of what we were looking at. We, cre we have created some very, very complicated uh, nonlinear excitations uh, because uh, a condensate is really a wonderful playground for nonlinear dynamics. There are very dramatic atom-atom uh, interactions in this system, and it's, it's highly coherent. 
but uh, and, and of course I'm more than happy to, to talk afterwards in more detail about these experiments but for now let me uh, kind of move on um, and pick up on how do we pick out that remember how I said we, we uh, kick out this state 2 defect the, the localized defect that we create in the condensate to create the voids in the state 1 condensate how do we create that um, how do we kick out that state 2 imprint well remind you of the process with the cartoon here we have the condensate coupling laser coming in from the right and then we uh, send the light pulse in, slow it down, compress it, stop it, form our dark state imprint. Uh, so in that process when we form the dark state imprint we transfer uh, an atom's part of the uh, population amplitude of an atom from state 1 to state 2 and we do that by the atom absorbing a probe uh, laser photon and then through stimulate emission the atom emits a coupling laser photon. Now if this process is indeed via stimulated rather than spontaneous, random spontaneous emission and since photons carry momentum we should see the, the part of the atom in state 2 getting kicked off with a very well defined uh, momentum recoil after these two photon processes. So we should actually see the uh, state 2 imprint that we have formed getting kicked out at a 45 degree angle. Okay, so back to the lab to, to check that. So we, ha we start with a state 1 condensate cigar shaped, illuminated as we, I did the cartoon with a coupling laser coming in from the right. And now to be fancy, we'll send two light pulses in on, on a collision course from both sides into the condensate stop them, extinguish them, and then uh, create our imprints. And now, before we see what happens uh, in the lab, we will retune the imaging laser such that it will selectively image atoms in state 2 so we can see what happens to this imprint that we create. So, uh, this is what it looks like. So clearly we get a couple of state 2 imprints kicked out. And these are obviously real atoms moving in the lab. Now we start to run out of field of view of the camera, so I put these images on the same figure. And if you look carefully here, uh, you can clearly see that we have nice 45 degree uh, kick out angles, so that, that the, the system is indeed fully coherent uh, via stimulated emission. So now you have this nice coherent process happening in a Bose-Einstein condensate. What that means is that these little clumps of state 2 atoms that you send out here they are themselves little condensates, but condensates of a different nature. They are condensates of atoms in state 2 generated, kicked out from a condensate of state 1 atoms. Also pay attention to, in, in close, if you look at this state uh, 2 imprint at, at short, at the early times, it has a boomerang shape, a clear boomerang shape. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, when you have this light pulse going into the condensate, slowing down. It will slow down most along the center line of the condensate where the density is highest. So the light pulse itself as it slows down will slow down most along the center line so it will develop a boomerang shape. And that boomerang shape is clearly reflected in the uh, boomerang shaped imprint that results, the dark state imprint that results. And it's also curious now to think, now we have this system here how about uh, once we have these guys flying out here, these state 2 imprints, what if we, se uh, we placed a second uh, condensate of state 1 atoms up here and let these state 2 imprints fly into that condensate? What would happen? That's exactly what some of our most recent, uh, recent experiments are about, where we create two separate Bose-Einstein condensates. They are separated spatially by 100, 200 microns and they are created in a deep double well potential. So the important thing I really want to stress here that, that these two condensates, they have been separated from birth, they have never seen each other. And what we then do is we illuminate uh, with a coupling laser from the right and then we send a laser pulse, a probe pulse, into the first left condensate. So, um, 
in a situation as seen here. So coupling laser in and then light pulse in, slows down, compresses, we stop it, we form our state 2 imprint and now this state 2 imprint starts moving, it exits the first condensate and moves out into free space. We have photographed this whole process and if you look at the right panel over here, we start with the two uh, condensates of state 1 atoms, we send our light pulse in, stop it, extinguish it in the first condensate and then 1.3 millisecond later we clearly see the state 2 imprint out here in free space, isolated in free space, moving along. And what we have created here is actually a perfect matter copy of the light pulse we have already extinguished in the first condensate. And this matter copy now moves along and eventually it'll reach the second condensate after some 2-3 milliseconds. And if we don't do anything, it'll actually move right through and come out on the other side. Okay, but now what if we do something? Uh, what if once that matter copy is, is deeply embedded in the second condensate here, if we then re-illuminate with a coupling laser, lo and behold, we regenerate the light pulse. You see it over here. So now in this whole process we have stopped and extinguished the light pulse in the first condensate and regenerated it from the second condensate. So the whole process is shown here, coupling laser in, light pulse into the first condensate, we convert it to a matter copy, it travels across in space to the second condensate and then we convert it back to a light pulse and moves right on. So now, how, how, how does this work? And it's a kind of thing, the more you think about it, I think, uh, the more weird it is actually. Because, uh, for example, uh, <coughs> These two sets of atoms, the matter copy and the second condensate, they have never seen each other before. So how on earth can they together figure out to regenerate this light pulse? The secret is that we are dealing with both Einstein condensates, where as I said in the beginning, the atoms are face locked. And one way of thinking about it is that when we illuminate uh, with a coupling laser, the atoms in the matter copy will act as little radiating antennas. And normally these uh, radiating antennas would be completely randomly faced with respect to each other and you would just get some totally random light out with absolutely no information content. But with the presence of that Bose-Einstein condensates, these ra uh, radiators, these antennas, get face locked and they can cooperate to coherently regenerate the light pulse so we can get the information back out into the light field. I can say it in a little bit more detail. Um, so if we look at the atoms in the matter copy, they start out in state two, we illuminate, and this of course uh, is, is we illuminate at the time that the matter copy is, is embedded in the, uh, in the second condensate. If we illuminate with a coupling laser, uh, this, the uh, atom will jump up from 2 to 3 and now the atom will actually, once it's in 3, it will, because of the presence of that macroscopic number of atoms in the receiver in the second condensate, it will scatter via stimulated uh, scattering into the uh, uh, state uh, 1 and it'll, it, it'll be a bosonic uh, matter wave stimulation stimulated by the presence of this Bose-Einstein condensate. So what happens is that the uh, atom in the matter copy will get converted to state one and at that point join the very same wave function as the atoms that are already in the receiver condensate. So that's how that face locking <coughs> happens. It, it face locks locally. Um, and then the, at the same time the uh, light uh, gets regenerated coherently, uh, the light pulse is regenerated, moves on under slow light conditions, and at the same time the matter copy uh, is left, converted from state two to state one, is left behind in the condensate, in the receiver condensate at the revival location. And eventually the light pulse comes out, speeds back out, and we can, we can detect it in our detector. But it's really funny because uh, uh, if you think about it, doing the uh, read-in process, the first part of the process, 
we really get the coherence from stimulation into the coupling laser field, so bosonic stimulation into a light field, into that laser field. Whereas in the last part of the process, we get the stimulation, the coherence, again from a bosonic stimulation, but a bosonic stimulation into a matter field. So we have created this full symmetry of light and matter. And you can really look at this process in two ways, as a way of manipulating light, or just as well as a way of manipulating matter, because what we really do is we pick up a little piece of the first condensate and move it over and dump it in a lo uh, controlled location in the second condensate. So this is also a, a controlled way of sculpting condensate wave functions. Um, and now, of course, you can, you can start playing with this system because once you, once you can turn light into matter and, and have a, all the information of the light pulse preserved in the matter copy, I mean, then you could, uh, once it's in matter form, it's easy to manipulate. You could uh, grab onto it, say, with an optical tweezer, or laser beam, put it on the shelf for a little bit, and then take it down again and, and let it into the second condensate, turn it back into light. Or why not, while you're holding onto it, uh, squish it a little and manipulate it. Change its shape, change its information content. Whatever changes you make to the matter copy should then be uh, present in the light pulse when you turn it back into light. And we already have an example right on this uh, figure here. Uh, in this uh, case here, we have actually sent a Gaussian-shaped light pulse into the first condensate, and by manipulating the matter copy, we can turn that into an output double hump light pulse. So all of a sudden, we can start to not just uh, create coherent memory buffers, we, but we can also start to do real uh, powerful processing of light by turning it into matter, uh, do our processing, and then turn it back into light with uh, all the information uh, in, in the original light pulse uh, uh, preserved in the conversion back and forth. And uh, this works in, in, in the classical regime for classical processing. It work, works for uh, quantum states of matter. And we can actually, for that matter, send uh, classical light pulses in and use the processing to turn them into quantum states of light. So uh, uh, use, uh, uses applications, for example, in connection, in connection with uh, quant creating quantum networks, uh, quantum secure cryptography. And uh, the... the uh, in this case here, we can kind of hold on to the matter copy for uh, some three to five milliseconds. In our latest experiments that uh, just came out recently, we can actually hold on to the matter copy for seconds. And that gives us uh, time for some real serious processing. And if you think about seconds for a light pulse, that's a long time. I mean, uh, in that time, a light pulse can go back and forth to the moon. Okay. So I think at the, um, at the very end here, uh, I want to uh, just use the last uh, piece of my talk to tell you about some fun stuff. <laughs> and um, it's our most uh, recent stuff that, was, that just came out in April. And I can sort of motivate it by, by saying that, well, gee, I mean, we have seen how we can manipulate Light, wouldn't it be fantastic if we can actually create a more uh, practical system? Um, and what's a better way of doing that than taking our big setup in the lab and squishing the whole thing onto the nanoscale? So that's one motivation. Maybe an even truer motivation for us is that uh, we just think that this is fun in interesting physics. And as you have sort of gathered, I think, from, from the figure here is that we are starting to merge cold atom physics with nanoscale technology. And what we have created in the lab, uh, we have grown in the lab uh, very long nanotubes, and I should stress freestanding nanotubes, uh, very long, 10 micron long, they're single walled, that means their diameter is a few nanometers. So they have an aspect ratio of roughly 10,000 to one. And again, they're freestanding, so you have a drying line on the, on the nanoscale. And then we can charge this, uh, this nanotubes up, this nanotube up to hundreds of moles. And what we then do is we create some cold atoms and then we start launching them dramatically uh, as projectiles towards this nanotube. And then we, we see what happens. Um, and actually what, what, what will happen to an atom uh, when it sees, uh, because of course, I mean, 
uh, well, maybe I should show you the setup actually before I talk more details. So uh, the practical setup is, um, in this case, we actually cool rubidium atoms with laser diodes. So we cool them to uh, roughly 100 microkelvin. So their RMS velocity is, is a few centimeters per second. And uh, then we create them uh, two centimeters away from a nanotube sample that we place at the apex of this cone structure. And that itself is, is placed on a two and three quarter inch flange. So that gives you the scale of things. And we launch these cold atoms uh, in the experiments we have, uh, I'm showing here. We are launching them with a, a very precise velocity we control with the laser beams uh, at five meters a second towards the nanotube. And let me also show you the nanotube here. Uh, this the nanotube sample that we, as I say, we grow in the lab, create in the lab. And we have really had to, to develop, push that technology uh, because, as I said, we, we want them freestanding, long, and very thin, and we want to charge them to high voltages. So um, we uh, create first, we etch first a, um, so, so we have a freestanding uh, membrane, silicon nitride and silicon oxide, two microns, thick roughly on a, a silicon, a piece of a silicon wafer. Um, and then we take that membrane uh, and uh, use a focused ion beam machine to iron mill a hole, an air hole in the membrane of 30, roughly 30 by 70 microns. And then we leave a couple of arms of the membrane sticking out here. And there's an, a gap between them of, of, of 10 microns. And then we put a little bit of iron catalyst on the tips of these membrane arms, stick it into our growth oven. And now we can uh, controllably grow a nanotube uh, right across uh, between these two arms here and obviously 10 micron longs and if we look in a TEM it's actually single walled just a few nanometers in diameter. And then we put uh, electrodes on the structure. Uh, you can see them up here uh, a few microns wide and then uh, this is an SEM uh, image. So outside the SEM image we uh, put some uh, big macroscopic electrodes on so we can hook, hook the structure up to our power supply <coughs> and charge the nanotube up to, uh, up to 300 volts. And if you think about it now, this is, uh, this is uh, an absolutely mathematically clean, infinitely thin charged wire. And so that there's an electric field here that falls off as one over the distance to the wire. So you'll get very large close to the wire. And now when we start to send neutral atoms in towards this uh, nanotube, that atom, these atoms will uh, polarize in the electric field. Of course, remember, they're not ions. They, they're, they're neutral. So they first have to polarize in the electric field. And that gives rise to a force on these atoms from the nanotube that is, uh, corresponds to a 1 over R squared attractive potential. Now, this is a very interesting potential because uh, com compared to what, you, what you're used to, like uh, what holds the atoms together, like the hydrogen atom, the Coulomb potential, that's a 1 over R uh, uh, potential. And the same for the, for the planets keeping them in orbit uh, around the sun, 1 over R potential. And of course, the 1 over R potential um, has, a, has a singularity uh, at the origin. But it's not like a dramatic singularity. Still, the uh, uncertainty principle can prevent the ground state from collapsing to the origin. We know the ground state has a, a size of roughly, in, in hydrogen, of, of, of roughly um, a, bore, a bore radius, like half an angstrom. And the, the ground state is, is found at minus, uh, roughly minus 13 eV. Now, very different for, for the 1 over R squared uh, attractive potential. Because in that case, it's a potential that sits right at the borderline between divergent but still regular, like the 1 over R potential, and highly singular potentials. So in the case of 1 over R, 1 over R squared potential, it's so singular that the uncertainty principle simply cannot prevent the ground state from collapsing to the origin. So the ground state energy is found at minus infinity. Uh, has very strange properties, and, and, and it's described in, in many foundational uh, quantum mechanics books, for example, uh, Moss and Fespark, and they really expand and describe this uh, 1 over R squared attractive potential. And then they end up saying, wow, it, it's a really interesting potential, but unfortunately, it's not realizable. But of course, here we have a system where we can realize it. 
And uh, not just in terms of its bound states, also in terms of its scattering states that we are currently uh, probing, it's very interesting. Because as I mentioned, uh, the 1 over R squared attractive potential has exactly the same, uh, well, it, it has the same uh, analytical form as a centrifugal barrier that, that we are well familiar with, but, but it, which is also 1 over R squared, but is repulsive. And uh, in this case, since we have a nice cylindrical symmetry, angular momentum is nice and conserved. So the total effective potential on one of these atoms will be a sum of the, angular, uh, the centrifugal barrier and our 1 over R squared attractive potential. So what that means is that there's a critical, a well-defined critical angular momentum such that if an atom has an angular momentum as it's shooting towards the uh, nanotube, an angular momentum that's less than that critical value, it will be captured by the nanotube with absolutely no possibility of escape, and it will start to, to spiral in towards the nanotube. And uh, let me just show you what the kind of dramatic <coughs> dynamics we, we get in this system. So here's an atom coming in. We launch it, and uh, now it gets captured there and just absolutely goes crazy. And if you partly look at the, um, the orbit time when it gets close to the nanotube actually goes all the way down to picoseconds. And now we also saw this guy coming off there dramatically, right? What was that about? Well, what happens is that the, as the uh, uh, atom is orbiting around picosecond orbit times, really like an ice princess uh, pulling the arms in uh, at, at the nanoscale. So well, the electric field very close to the atom very close to the nanotube because we charge it high and the nanotube is very thin, the electric field gets very large, roughly three volt per nanometer or, or higher. That means that the electric field from the nanotube on the atom is as large as what is holding, the forces holding the atom together. So uh, we charge the nanotube positively. So what the nanotube will do when the atom is, is spiraling around uh, uh, close in, it'll suck the electron right off the atom. And now all of a sudden, we are left with a positive ion in close proximity to a positively charged nanotube. Burp, it just kicks off like a projectile. Iron, high, high uh, energy. And now we can detect that uh, high energy ion very easily uh, with a channel tron. So we can actually, um, and that's why we, we have some data here showing some of that. So we can actually follow atom by atom, atom by single atom, this whole process of the atom getting captured as soon as it has an angular momentum below the critical value and then starts it dramatic orbiting and then getting ionized and the ion getting kicked off. And uh, what we expect here is uh, that the, uh, of course, the higher the, the, the voltage on the nanotube, the higher the charge density, the larger is that uh, critical angular momentum. And since we start with cold atoms, uh, and launch them with a well-defined velocity. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between impact parameter and angular momentum. So the critical angular momentum also corresponds to a very well-defined critical impact parameter. In other words, an atom that happens to come within a certain radius, we could call it a, a death radius of the nanotube, will get captured with absolutely no possibility. Its fate is sealed, no possibility of escape. So in that sense, you could really compare it to, to black hole dynamics, not gravitationally governed, but, but governed by an electric field. And the atom then starts its spiraling orbit in and then gets, gets ripped apart when it gets close to the nanotube. And the, uh, the capture range is enormous from the point of view of, of the nanotube. It's in the micron regime, uh, a thousand times uh, larger than the diameter of the nanotube. So it's really stretching its arms out. And now if we, if we measure the number of, of ions corresponding to the number of atoms we, we capture per each time we launch a cold atom cloud towards the nanotube as a function of the voltage that we uh, put on the nanotube, as I say, we expect a linear uh, slope and indeed we see that. So that's quite nice actually. We exactly see this capture, uh, crazy capture uh, stuff going on here. But then clearly it takes a certain threshold voltage for this process to kick on. And why is that? The reason is that um, for, for low enough voltages, uh, the, uh, w when the electron gets uh, sucked from the potential of the atom, we have the Coulomb potential of the atom close to the nanotube, when the electron gets sucked off the, uh, off the atom into the nanotube, it actually has to quantum tunnel. And if the electric field 
is not large enough, if the voltage is not large enough close to the nanotube, it simply can't get through the tunneling barrier, so, so the ionization doesn't happen. But then as soon as, and then of course it's a very dramatic threshold because it's a, it's a, a quantum tunneling that all of a sudden will, will start up. Uh, and I should mention also, since I said we can follow these atoms ions one by one, so of course we can time, time stamp them. So when we detect them in the channel tron, we give them a time stamp. So we measure the arrival time with a nanosecond precision. And of course we also know when we launch the atoms because we determine that uh, when we launch it with a laser beam. So uh, we can study the dynamics uh, in the two regimes here, uh, uh, very in, in dynamics, uh, study the dynamics very, very detailed. So if you look first at atoms um, that are uh, launched with high voltages uh, on the nanotube in this regime here, we get a typical time signal, arrival time signal of ions coming in uh, after we launch uh, the atoms uh, centered around, narrowly centered around four milliseconds. Well, four milliseconds is just the time it takes a five meter per second atom to travel from its initial location two centimeter away from the nanotube. And then the uh, little bit of spread we have in times is just a reflection of the spatial, initial spatial distribution of the cold atom cloud. Now if you look at the lower voltages in the threshold region, you can see there's clearly a long tail here. So what, what's happening here is that as, uh, for the lowest voltages, the ionization happens very close to the nanotube surface. So the electron hops off, the atom goes into the nanotube, but then unfortunately, since the ion is created so close to the nanotube surface, it gets trapped by its own image potential in the nanotube. So this uh, picosecond orbiting uh, ion will, will actually orbit around for a long time, for easily up to milliseconds or beyond, before it finally makes it way off and we can detect it in the detector. So this experiment showed that we really have, uh, can clearly study what happens at micron distances in the macroscopic capture range and then at the same time we can also study the fine dynamics that happen in this system of atom of nanotube down to the nano, nanometer uh, scale. Um, and it's worth pointing out that even in, in the linear regime at high voltages, if, if, we, if we can sort of in, improve our experiments and get more statistics, we should actually, I believe we should uh, be able to zoom in uh, look at more detail of this linear dependence and then we'll have to realize, I think, that uh, quantum mechanically uh, we have to remember that the angular momentum is quantized, should be quantized, uh, quantized in units of h-bar. So that means as, as if we are trying to increase the voltage on the nanotube, we don't capture more ions until we have increased the voltage enough to capture an extra h-bar of angular momentum. So we should see that increase happen in discrete quantum step, steps in a quantum ladder like here. And the distance between the steps, uh, if we take the voltage distance, is quite macroscopic. Uh, for this system, it should be roughly 60 millivolts. And then, of course, we can think of a, a lot of other fun things uh, to do with, it, uh, with this system. Let me just mention one more, which is rather than just putting a DC voltage on the nanotube, we could also put an AC voltage on. And doing that, we can actually stabilize the <coughs> atomic motion around the nanotube. So we should actually be able to create stable orbits of this uh, orbiting atom uh, orbiting very rapidly at picosecond orbit time at, around the nanotube uh, in at a distance from a few nanometers from the nanotube. And then imagine we could uh, have several atoms, maybe many atoms orbiting in this toroidal trap, and we should be able to create uh, I think some new uh, cold uh, matter states with very interesting correlations, correlated, correlations dictated by the very strong dipole-dipole interactions we will have for these polarized atoms around the nanotube. Okay, but I think uh, with that I should really stop and just uh, end up showing you the great team of, of students and postdocs who have worked really hard on, on the projects I have told you about, and maybe just point out Naomi Ginsberg, who was a grad student with us, uh, and Sean Garner, those two guys, worked on the two condensate um, uh, projects. And uh, Naomi, uh, she just started as an assistant professor at Berkeley, uh, and here's Anne Gottsell and Trick Baristoff. Those two guys worked on the nanotube project, and Anne graduated in January, and she has also just started as an assistant professor this month. So that's it. Thank you.